welcome to the 54th theoretical physics colloquium by uh, Professor Mike uh, Strickland from Kent State University. He got his PhD from Duke University in 1997. He had several postdoctoral positions including uh, ones at Ohio State University, University of Washington. He was a visiting assistant professor for a year in Duke between 2001 and 2002. He became Lise Meitner Fellow at Vienna Technical University in 2002, where he spent two years. He moved to Helsinki Institute of Physics and then became a junior fellow at Frankfurt Institute for Advanced Studies between 2000 in 2008. In 2008, he got a faculty position at Gertesberg College. And then he moved to uh, his current university, Kent State University, in 2013, where he remains since. Uh, he was a director of the Center for Nuclear Research at Kent State University between 2015 and 2019. And he is a vice director since 2019. He serves on the National Advisory Committee of the Institute for Nuclear Theory in Seattle for the next two years. His research interests are very diverse, including nuclear and high energy theory, astrophysics, atomic physics, general uh, physics uh, that includes uh, many topics, uh, covers many topics, including heavy ion physics, high temperature, high density, uh, QCD, non-equilibrium quantum field theory, relativistic viscous hydrodynamics, equation of state in astrophysics, and many, many other things. I will not be able to cover everything here in a brief introduction, so let me go and present his title, Batomium Suppression in the QGP, from Effective Field Theories to Non-Unitary Quantum Evolution. And with that, I'll give the microphone to Mark. Thanks very much, Igor. Um, I was trying to remember this morning the first time I crossed paths with Igor, which I believe was circa 1997, 98, maybe in Columbus. In Columbus at an APS meeting. And then we, we crossed paths yet again when we were both ended up in Frankfurt. So, you know, life is funny that way. All right. So, thanks to Igor for the invitation to present this work. Um, um, the work has been done in collaboration with Nora Brambilla, Miguel Escobedo. Um, Antonio Viro, a student in Munich named Peter Vandergrind, and Johannes Weber, who's, who's now in Berlin. Um, in the end, I'll show results um, from a paper that hit the archive in December, and then I'll show you some forthcoming results which are in preparation. Let's see if I can get it to advance the slide. All right, so the basic picture for bottomonium suppression is that if we create a very high temperature quark on plasma, then what's going to happen is that uh, these uh, bound states are going to dissociate with the dissociation temperature going basically with the binding energy of the state. So if you have a, an upsilon 1s that might have a, a very large binding energy, this one is the one that you expect to, to melt the, the last. Now these um, original pictures of, of melting of these states relied on the, on the kind of picture of Debye screening in the plasma in which you can imagine if you had a zero temperature uh, potential, which is shown here on the right as the black line, something that looks like a Cornell potential, it would support some number of states. But as you, as you jack up the temperature and you see some screening effect, you could see some, some of the states will become unbound as, as a result of this. Um, so, so this was the, the state of the art circa uh, late 1980s. And then in, I guess, around 2005, 2006, people started to realize that there was another effect going on that was uh, perhaps more important. And that's the fact that if you look in medium, um, of course, these bound states don't have an infinitely thin width. They have some in medium spectral width. And, and this is due to exchange of gluons with the medium. Um, and, and results in basically a higher breakup rate of these states um, just because they're, they're surrounded by QGP medium. Now, the loose way that I said here is that, you know, basically you're being hit by lots of, of gluons and other quarks uh, when you're, you're going through, and this can also break you up at temperatures that are below the normal um, temperature that you would get from just complete dissociation due to, to Dubai screening. And these spectral widths are on the order for the upsilon, for example, 
um, at say 300 MeV on the order of 100 MeV. So that means that they're decaying on a lifetime that's uh, relevant um, on QGP uh, timescales. So um, we now have to take both of these things into account. So I, um, on the left, I show you what a typical uh, Upsilon 1S, 2S, and 3S observation might look like. This is from LHCB and in proton-proton uh, collisions, there's some background and then standing on top of it, you can very clearly see these, uh, these peaks in the dimuon spectrum. Um, and that's how typically we're going to observe all of these uh, states. Um, because we're restricted to the, to the dimuon channel, that means we can only see the S wave states. Um, in principle, there will also be effects on the P wave states like the chi Bs. Um, however, these are harder to detect because they decay electromagnetically down to the 1s states, and so you would have to reconstruct a photon and a final 1s um, through the dilepton channel. Now, if we imagine sitting inside of the quark on plasma and we started jacking up the temperature, uh, what we imagine is that in our brain, this is a cartoon, is that these widths are getting uh, larger, and as we keep jacking up the temperature, eventually these states are going to completely disappear. Now, um, we have evidence that this is occurring in the experimental data. Um, so on the, on the left is the PP um, spectra um, normalized to the background. Um, and we can once again see, in this case, with very high resolution, these 1s, 2s, and 3s peaks. On the right um, is the, uh, the corresponding result uh, collected in a lead-lead collision. Um, it's the the blue that's sitting down here and put to guide the eye here is the red, which is the, the PP results simply scaled by the number of, of binary scatterings. As we can see, there's a, a quite large suppression of even the, the 1S. Um, and by the time we get to the 3S, it's, it's completely gone from the spectrum. And, and this was sort of anticipated, um, as I said, by the fact that this uh, breakup is, is sort of proportional to the binding energy. So the ones that have the lowest binding energy are expected to melt first and, 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 and those with the highest last. Now this uh, understanding extends to the, the in-medium breakup width as well, because the excited states have a higher in-medium breakup width than the, than, the, uh, than the ground state. So even in, in models in which you, you simply have this ordering of the widths, uh, the same phenomena will occur. Now, of course, there's a control to this. We can go in a step from PP down to, to, P, to lead lead, we can also consider what would happen in P-LED collisions. And here is a comparison. Again, the blue line is the P-LED uh, signal and the, the red is the expected one simply scaled up. And uh, as we can see here, there's an effect, but it's much smaller than what we're seeing in the, in the lead-lead collisions. And uh, um, th this leads us to believe that what's going on here is that we're seeing truly the suppression due, due to quark on plasma creation in the, in the, in the case of lead light collisions. So um, in the talk, I'm gonna focus on bottomonium. You know, I could give a longer talk involving termonia as well, but I wanna focus on bottomonium for a very specific reason. And that's because essentially when it cook, all boils down, it's because the bottom mass is simply very big, right? The bottom mass is on the order of five GeV. And as a, as a consequence, the the bottomonium states themselves have masses on the order of 10 GeV. So the, the benefit of having these very high uh, energy scales, in this case, the mass, is that we can A, trust heavy quark effective theory more than we can um, for say the charmonium mass. I'm not saying that you can't completely, you can't trust it completely, but you know, of course we want to go into limits where our, our effective theories are, are in principle more uh, valid. In addition, uh, Having this large quark mass helps us to um, reduce potential cold nu nuclear matter effects because these are expected to go down as the heavy quark mass uh, goes down. There's basically a heavy, more heavy billiard ball that's propagating through um, perhaps this very fleeting nuclear medium before the quark one plasma is created. Because of the large mass of these bottomonium states, you won't get any thermal production, right? It's an e to the minus 10 effect to get any thermal production of a bottomonium state. And, and, uh, and additionally, um, the bottom quark, 
cross section is, is quite small, even for open bottom quirk production in RIC and LHC heavy ion collisions. So that also tells us that we're going to have a reduced probability for regeneration of bottomonia through statistical recombination. Now, in the charmonium sector, the observation of, of statistical recombination as we move from RIC to LHC energies tells us that, in fact, we're, we're, we're sort of starting to thermalize the charm sector. At least that's the standard interpretation. And this complicates matters because now it becomes a, a sort of even more many body problem because now you have to invoke uh, you know, recombination with open um, heavy flavor and such. So the idea in the beginning was to try to go to bottomonium so that we could reduce all of the um, modeling uncertainties that are inherent in, in doing recombination. And studies to date, including those by myself and, and Ralph Rapp, have shown, in fact, that uh, if you try to estimate the, the effect of recombination on these states, it, it's quite small. Now, in the end of this talk, I will, I will show a quantum formalism in which, which can include recombination, but only what I guess Edward Shuriak would call local recombination, in which a, a bound state can break, uh, become, go from singlet to octet. So it's unbound for some moment in time. It can then reabsorb another uh, gluon from the medium and then transition back into a singlet state. So in that sense, we do have uh, regeneration, but it's, it's more local, what I would call quantum regeneration of the states and not in the statistical sense. At a conceptual level, the way we want to think about this is our, our kind of standard brick picture in quark and plasma physics, but now it's a quantum brick. So we have... Uh, we have some quantum mechanical incoming state that has overlap with the upsilon 1s and 2s and so on. We're going to shoot it through our quark gluon plasma, and then we're going to ask what's the quantum state on, on the right-hand side. And by computing uh, the uh, absolute, the modulus squared of A primed over modulus squared of A, we can judge the relative probability of uh, finding uh, the upsilon 1s in the final state compared to the initial state. Now, this can also be couched in the language of the density matrix in which we sum over some uh, complete set of, uh, of orthogonal states. And these are simply the incoming probabilities and the P primes are the um, outgoing probabilities. My question. Yes. Uh, do these states superpositions only have hidden uh, bottom uh, components or also open? At, at in other the words, moment, can they only have hidden. So you down. can only reshuffle epsilons, but you cannot uh, dissociate them. We can dissociate them into an octet state, essentially. So there, there's still a BB bar state in octet configuration. Okay, um, so so in addition to the singlet color singlet states that you have listed here, you also have octet states. Yes. Okay, thanks. Yes, and and the initial wave functions that we shoot in here will will not just be a linear superposition of bound states. They'll also have uh, some overlap with uh, free unbound states as well. Um, so um, the reason that we can sort of think about bottomonium in this way is that they have this large binding energy and therefore uh, they're produced locally by hard, hard uh, processes like gluon fusion. And they're produced very early in the quark gluon plasma's lifetime at times on less than one Fermi over C. For, bottom, for the upsilon one s, the estimate's around 0 0.2 Fermi over C. And then we can think that, you know, in our minds that they're then propagating through the plasma and interacting with the medium they can potentially break up and reform due to these in-medium transitions. And, and uh, so that, that's our sort of conceptual picture uh, of what's going on. Now, um, these days, we the, the underlying models that, that attempt to describe this um, are based on basically potential models in which there's an in-medium potential that has both a real and imaginary part. And the real part is, is uh, and modifications thereof are related to the in-medium screening effects. And the imaginary part is related to this uh, in-medium breakup rate um, that I was telling you about um, earlier. Now, before going into some complicated uh, or <laughs> beautiful, I should say, calculation of how, how you get to this um, from first principles, I wanted to show you sort of a heuristic way of, of understanding this. So first, we, we could just consider a non-relativistic bound state subject to a noisy potential. So we have our normal um, kinetic and, and uh, potential term, and now we're going to add some time-dependent noise. 
which acts independently on um, our quark and our anti-quark. And then this noise has some um, specific properties. It should average to zero. Um, zero mean, it's, it's uncorrelated in time. That's this delta function sitting over here. And it has some spatial correlation function, which we call D. So you imagine you could generate your favorite noisy background through, through which to shoot one of these bound states. And then you want to ask, what is the, um, the effect of this noise field? And in particular, if we average over all noise configurations, um, what's the final uh, dy dynamics that emerges? So um, to look at this, what you can do is just take the time evolution operator and expand it in this case to second order. You have to go to second order because these uh, noise fields, because of this uh, uncorrelated nature in time, they go like one over the time step essentially to some power. So there, there are terms that have to be taken care of here in the second order expansion as well. Those are the ones that are second order in these noise fields. And then, uh, so this is how you would in principle, at least uh, for small delta t, you would evolve the wave function in the presence of this noise field. And now, as I said, you wanna imagine averaging over all of these possible noises that are going on to get a kind of effective Hamiltonian evolution for the wave function as it prop propagates through this quantum noise, if you will. And uh, so you, you can get that and uh, you simply from the above equation, you, you have to average over the noise fields that are appearing here in, in the second term of this expansion. And if we go back and, and plug in this defining relation for all of these correlation functions here, um, you'll find that you can easily express this effective Hamiltonian as the original real part that we had. And then an imaginary part is generated, which is related in this case to the to this, uh, the color of the noise that we, we put into the system, the spatial correlations. Um, and from here, you can just read out in this language what this imaginary part of the potential would be. Now, I tried to step you through my conceptual understanding of this in this, in this way of thinking about it. You, want, you, you, you have to do the path integral, right? So what you wanna do is shoot a wave fun function through some noisy potential, and then you have to sum over all possible configurations of the noise, and that's what's going on here. And essentially what's happening is that the imaginary part um, emerges through the wave function interfering with itself as it passes through all of the realizations of this noise. So th this is a, um, one way to understand how you get this imaginary part without having to go through complicated uh, quantum field theory calculations. But what we want to do <laughs> is uh, derive it from first principles QCD. And it turns out there's a connection. Um, you can follow your nose through this and do some, something called the Feynman-Vernon uh, uh, path integral uh, or a fluctuation formalism. And then you can, given a, a quantum field theory, then compute this function D that's sitting here. But we wanna do more than, than that um, because in this formalism that I, I wrote here, this noise was colorless. So if you wanna ramp this up and start including also octet configurations, you would also have to add some colored noise and you can imagine that it gets uh, difficult quickly. So in, instead of following that path, uh, what we're gonna to try to do is, is derive some evolution equations for the, the density matrix of the system. In this case, we're going to we're going to do it not for the full density matrix of the system, but something called the reduced density matrix. So we imagine taking our system. This could be the path integral, for example, and we separate it into probe and uh, medium degrees of freedom, and then we we're going to integrate out the medium degrees of freedom, and then try to get the density matrix that describes just the evolution of the of the probe. Now, of course, the 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 uh, evolution has to be unitary um, when we include both uh, uh, sub subsystem A and subsystem B, but the moment we integrate out some degrees of freedom, the resulting evolution for the probe um, can be non-unitary. To do this formally, you can decompose the, the total Hamiltonian into a part that's coming from the probe and from the medium, and then some interaction term between the probe and the medium. 
Now, how you organize this depends on what uh, system of approximations you want to do. You could imagine perturbation theory here. What we're going to do is, is treat this in effective field theory, essentially. Now, if it were the total density matrix with sums over probe and medium degrees of freedom, we know how to write down that density matrix in equilibrium, for example. And we know how to write down evolution equations for this thing. But if we do this trick of integrating out uh, the medium degrees of freedom, um, what is the evolution equation that's obeyed by just the probe part? And <clears throat> the, the answer to that is that it, 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 it can be cast into the form of something called the Lindblad equation. Now that's not completely general. In general, you get something called a master equation, which will tell you how to update the reduced density matrix. And from the master equation, there are various limits that, that can emerge. I'm going to focus today on the, on the limit that results in, in the Lindblad equation. Um, and in that case, the system is, is, uh, is, Mar is, uh, is Markovian, and you can reduce it down to the simple form in the, on the bottom. Now, what, what are the, the assumptions that go in, into this uh, reduction of the master equation to the Lindblad equation? Well, there's three fundamental time scales. One is the medium relaxation time scale, which is you know, some correlator of two uh, operators in the medium and how fast the medium relaxes back to, um, to equilibrium, essentially after you, you disturb it. Then there are uh, time scales associated with the probe itself. So in the, in the Upsilon system, you can think of this as the, the level spacing uh, between the, the internal Upsilon levels. And then there's the probe relaxation time scale, which is something about the, uh, the relaxation of the probe itself. And if um, the, the medium relaxation time is much, much shorter than these other two relaxation times in that particular limit, um, you can ignore essentially the back reaction of the, the medium back onto the probe, and then you can, you can get this uh, what's called Lindblad equation. And the first term looks similar uh, to what we, we see canonically in quantum mechanics. We have some commutator between some probe Hamiltonian and some probe uh, density matrix. But then we pick up these additional terms here, where the Cs in the literature can be called Lindblad operators, collapse operators, jump operators. Um, th this is what emerges. And um, in this equation is trace preserving of, the, of this ro row probe. So if you, you start uh, with a density matrix that sums to one, you're gonna end up with a density matrix that sums to one. So that means you can just shuffle things back and forth inside of the density matrix. And formally, another nice thing here is that it's completely positive. So you'll never get uh, unphysical probabilities out of this formalism, let's say. So how can we tie this assumption here, um, which results in the Lindblad equation to the problem at hand, which is bottomonium itself. And for that, we need to, we need to talk about the scales uh, that enter into the bottomonium problem. So we already talked about the bottom quark mass itself, um, which is on the order of five GeV, it's very large. Um, but the other scale, which isn't a dimensional full one, but which is something that we can, we can expand in here is the, um, is the velocity, uh, the relative velocity of the, of the quark and the anti-quark inside of, of the bound state. And um, you, can, you can estimate this uh, and it's around 0 0.1 times the speed of light. So in fact, these, these bottomonium states are, are very well non-relativistic. We can look at the, the shifts in the energy levels, um, which are the energy spacings that we see here in, a, in our typical uh, spectroscopic plots and those scale like mv squared and um, the hyperfine uh, or the fine structure splitting here rather um, scales like mv to the four. So um, just by looking at the experimental um, experimentally observed bottomonium spectra, you see that it just sort of falls into this class where um, it, it really looks like a coulombic bound state um, with, with a rel non-relativistic mass. Now, just to show you a sketch of, of how well this works in practice, um, this was just some non-relativistic potential model. Uh, it was with some uh, Cornell potential with a, a couple of parameters. And if you, you tune to just uh, two or three uh, bits of the, of the bottomonium spectra, you can, you can then reproduce all the, all the mass states uh, with amazing, uh, the, the masses of the states with amazing precision. 
So uh, these are going to be our, our basic scales that are going to, to pop up in the problem. Um, this is sort of the, uh, the scale of the, of the binding energy, and these are going to be subleading corrections due to, to fine structure. Now, this was all made formal back in the, in the late 80s and, and the early 90s by, uh, by Caswell Lepage, uh, Bodwin, Breton, and Lepage. And they were able to write down sort of effective Lagrangian once we integrate out the heavy quark mass scale, um, since M is much, much bigger than uh, lambda QCD and T, we can then obtain uh, the following effective Lagrangian, which is called the Lagrangian of non-relativistic QCD. Um, the, the, the theory base is based on these, this sort of separation of scales between the hard gluons that, that have momentum and energy on the order of M, soft gluons that now have uh, energy and momentum on the order of MV, and then uh, potential gluons that have energy on the order of MV squared and momentum on the order of MV, and then finally ultra soft gluons um, with, with energy on the order of, of MV squared. So um, this is the starting point for the, for, the, for the next step in the development of these uh, effective field theories. And that the next step is what's called potential NRQCD. So in that, what we're going to do is go one scale further down and we're going to integrate out um, this soft scale, um, which parametrically is, is, is the same as the inverse size of the states. And we can collapse then you know, sort of QCD-like uh, diagrams down to point-like interactions between what are going to be um, uh, singlet and octet fields on these vertices and some um, matching coefficients, which in the end um, turn out to be the potentials uh, themselves. So there's a, a well-defined uh, power counting underlying this. So this one I already mentioned over here that the, the bound states are small and and that, uh, uh, that V in, in, in this expression is also small. And then also starting from here, you, um, you gauge, uh, you, uh, you uh, do a, a multipole expansion of all the gauge fields and, uh, and then get, get the final following result, which I'm gonna show you on the next slide. So after integrating out uh, the scale one over R, um, what, you result, what you get is an, an effective Lagrangian of the following form. So you have your normal um, Yang-Mills term, but then the rest has been uh, boiled down to terms involving the singlet um, bound states, the octet bound states, and then transitions between them, which diagrammatically correspond to, to little pictures like this. And in this case, there's a, an explicit singlet potential, which you can check is, is just a, to this order in the expansion is simply a, a, a Coulomb potential or an attractive one. And the octet potential is the normal repulsive uh, octet potential. So once you, you have this, and, and there's some other functions here, which, which are known, um, but once you have this Lagrangian, you can then proceed to, to do diagrammatic calculations. In particular, you might uh, want to calculate, <laughs> for example, the self-energy uh, in the, the schwinger keldish formalism. So that's what these diagrams are, are shown in the bottom. And uh, here we're just, uh, we have uh, these two and one are, are indicating um, uh, jumps between uh, different parts of the swinger keldish contour and lines and double lines are, are singlet and, and octet respectively. Now this, I didn't show this particular set of diagrams for no reason. This is the one that the, the set of diagrams that you have to consider to start pinning down um, from the microscopic theory, what, what are these Lindblad operators that are sitting here? Because these are telling us fundamentally about transitions between singlet and octet with either gluon or, or um, um, a gluon admission or absorption. And that, that comes from cuts of, of all of these diagrams, of course. So um, to summarize and, and try to put everything on the same page, um, how do we now go from you know, QCD down to the Lindblad equation? So we started with QCD, um, we integrate out the scale M um, through, and use perturbative matching to get down to the, the Laplage, Broughton, NRQCD. Then we further integrate out the soft scale to get down to this, this PR NRQCD. The scales in the problem are the temperature, the bound state mass, which is much, much greater than the temperature, the bound state size, which is um, 
typically very small, right? For the upsilon, it's, it's less than, it's about 0.2 Fermi or something on that order, right? Then of course, if we have a medium around, there's gonna be another scale, which is the, the Debye mass of the medium itself. And then as we discussed before, the, the binding energy, which is basically the level spacing um, in, the, in our system. So the medium relaxation time over here will essentially go like one over, over, the, the, over the temperature locally in general arguments. So this, this is the time scale on which the medium will relax back to equilibrium. These um, uh, intrinsic probe time scales are one over the binding energy. So that's one over E in our language. And then also the uh, relaxation time you can estimate it comes from one over the self energy um, in this language. And then if you, you look at the consequences of this, uh, you know, this ordering of the scales, that means that um, we, in, the, in our theory, um, this is the, the correct equation because we have one over R much, much greater than T, much, much greater than E. Now you'll notice in the middle here, we don't make an assumption about the ordering of the scales M, D, and T. So these can in fact be overlapping and, um, and that might be the case in a real QGP, right? Because G is, is not is order one, right? However, this scale separation between the size of the bound states and and uh, and and the binding energy that that remains. So if you you make this standard set of assumptions that one follows from going from QCD to PR and QCD um, with this specific ordering of scales, you land in in this Lindblad equation. And I already made the point from this slide, so I can skip that. All right, so um, I'll show you what the explicit forms of these, um, these collapse operators are um, in a second, but let's just look here first at the, at the Lindblad equation in some more detail. So as I said, there's a first term that, that looks like something we, we recognize. It turns out you can combine this with the other uh, red term that's sitting here um, with the following understanding. So um, if, you, if you look at CN dagger CN, this turns out to just be the, the partial decay width in some channel N um, for the state that you're looking at. And this sum over N out here of that C dagger N C CN is just the total decay width. So in fact, we can take this uh, second red term in the Lindblad equation and merge it with this one by um, rewriting our, our Hamiltonian as now a, an effective Hamiltonian that has the original Hermitian probe Hamiltonian and now this complex part, which you can now see the explicit connection to the, um, the total in medium decay width. So um, it, at least with, if we were to ignore this term in the evolution, what we would get is just evolution with a non-unitary Hamiltonian and we can compute what that non-unitary Hamiltonian is. However, that would be cheating because we, we still have to take this, this term into account, which is the thing that's going to, to transition us between different um, microstates within the theory during the evolution. So what do the forms of these operators look like that, that come out? Um, so so uh, I'm not gonna go through the derivation, it's a colloquium, um, but the, the, the structure of this is that first we take the, the density matrix, we're gonna decompose it into singlet and octet subblocks. And then you can write down uh, uh, operators in this sort of uh, high level description that in which uh, these guys will transition from singlet to octet. So for example, if I put in one zero, which is a singlet state in here, I will get out an octet state. And if I put in an octet state in here, I will get a, a singlet state out. If I put an octet state in here, which is one zero, um, I get <laughs> nothing out. And if I put a, uh, sorry, if I put a singlet state in here, I get nothing out, I put octet state in here, I get octet out. So these, these little matrix operators allow us to you know, formally control these transitions between singlet, octet, octet, singlet, and octet, octet. And the normalizations that are sitting out here have two numbers, right? There's some number called kappa. Um, this is, uh, is related to a um, time-ordered correlator of, of chromoelectric fields. And this is uh, related to the heavy quark diffusion constant in the, in the quark lone plasma. There's an intimate relation. Um, and then there's just color counting factors, which just come from how many states you have to, available to jump to and, and, by, and, and so forth. 
So um, once you have this sort of explicit form uh, for these collapse operators uh, uh, performed, you can now write out a sort of matrix form for the, for the right-hand side of the Lindblad equation. You get an explicit uh, real modification where another transport coefficient called gamma appears, which is simply the imaginary part of the same uh, chromoelectric correlator. And it represents the, the real shift of the potential, or if you like, the screening effect. And as you can see, it, it has a different effect on singlet and octet um, just by some, some color factors. And if you compute the total in medium uh, decay width by, um, in this case, what you get is again, um, something that depends on whether you're in the singlet and octet state. Um, and it looks like a, a nice quadratic, it has Ri squared. So with this, we can now begin to try to solve this equation because now we know all of the pieces um, that are here. The, in the end, there's only two coefficients, gamma and kappa, which are related to some transport coefficients that you can measure you know, on the lattice and have been measured. So um, just to remind you in pictures, what, what are these uh, operators doing? So in the first part of the evolution over here, these two terms, um, you, uh, you would evolve with a fixed color state and a fixed angular momentum state. But then these jump operators, what they're doing is they, you might be in a singlet in L is equal to zero. You might then get jumped up to an octet uh, with L is equal to one. And then you can imagine any path you like around here that might return you back to the, to the state that you started with, which in my case, uh, I can't find one <laughs> all of a sudden. Oh, there's one. <laughs> so uh, in this way, we can jump away from the bound state and jump back. And, and we can keep track of the evolution of not only the color state, but also the angular momentum state at all moments in time. Okay, so now I've, I've tried to convince you we have all the essentially log Lego building blocks we need to solve this equation, but um, let me first specify what the transport coefficients are. So um, you, can, you can compute these in, in a variety of different ways. Um, what we're going to use is, a, is a, a, a measurement from the TOOM QCD collaboration. What's shown here is this, uh, uh, is kappa divided by t cubed to make it dimensionless as a function of t over tc. Um, the, the bars here are the lattice data um, with, with errors, and then the um, orange with a band around it is the a next to leading order PR, uh, a next to leading order NRQCD calculation. And then the, um, the blue one here is a fit where they adjusted some coefficient in the next to leading order um, calculation to, to better reproduce the lattice data. So what we're going to use for what I show you today is going to be with the blue band where they adjusted the, the kappa to be slightly larger. Um, so what the plot is telling us is not only do we know kappa at this point, we also know that it, it's temperature dependence and even going out to very high temperatures where, where it gets quite small. And so what we did was just construct a, a kind of function that will tell us what is kappa as a function of temperature and we plug that into the code. And then we're gonna vary from the top to the bottom of this blue band. The other transport coefficient gamma um, is, is, I would say much less well known. Um, there have been some attempts to try to measure it on the lattice um, with the three best attempts sitting here um, in, the, in the black uh, points. And uh, they cover quite a, a wide range. Recent measurements by, um, by Peter Petreski and, and others have, have suggested that this is quite small, that essentially there's no in medium mass shift of the bound states. The only thing that's happening is that they're acquiring a width. Um, but at the moment that we wrote the paper, and, and I, I would say still, we don't know uh, enough to pin down this, this coefficient gamma here beyond what I've shown here is, is the gray band. In fact, what we've done is extend the gray band all the way to zero because it seems like, at least at this moment in time, it could be zero. <laughs> we can't rule that out. So those are going to be our, our two uh, fundamental parameters to vary. So with that, we now know everything to solve the equation. How would we go about solving this? Um, so as I said, we, we take the density matrix, break it down into color uh, space. You could then imagine trying to decompose it into orbital angular momentum in the singlet and the octet uh, blocks. If you um, truncate that or orbital angular momentum um, 
uh, truncation at L max, you'll will quickly find that you have a, a matrix of size L max plus one. And now you want to put this on a computer. Um, so you're going to have to discretize the wave functions that are underlying the, uh, the density matrix there. And let's say you want to do it on a lattice with n points. You quickly um, get a matrix size, which is n squared L max plus one. And in principle, we want to take n and L max to infinity, right? Um, to remove any possible effects from angular momentum cutoffs and any possible effects from just the uh, discretization effects on the, on the lattice. And uh, um, because this is a matrix equation that's involving lots of matrix multiplications on the right, um, naively, um, this thing scales like n cubed on the right um, with with modern fancy matrix multiplication techniques, you might be able to get it down to 2.3, um, but uh, it, it, it gets very hard to solve this matrix problem once, you, once the size gets this quite large. Not only in terms of the computational complexity, but also simply in terms of the memory, uh, you, you will find out that quickly you also start running out of memory on your computer. So um, if you just try to naively attack this, um, if you need to take large L max, you're, you're gonna run into trouble. If you need to use fine lattices, you're gonna run into trouble. And as I, I told you in the beginning, uh, we, we want to describe both bound and unbound states. So some of the states in the simulation will have quite large radii because they're, they're actually running away from one another. And um, so we need to be able to have to describe the bound state evolution, which is happening at small scales and the, and the unbound evolution that's happening at large scale. So we're gonna need large N and large L max. So um, there were some initial studies that looked at this with, you know, on, on small lattices and with, you know, L max of one, they work quite well. But once you try to think about uh, scaling it up, um, you quickly run into trouble. So um, the solution turns out to be provided by, uh, not, not by us, but by, by open, you know, like, uh, what should I say, atomic physicists days ago, right? So they, they ran into these, these kinds of things that they needed to solve. And uh, they invented something called the quantum trajectories algorithm to solve it. And in the quantum trajectories algorithm, what you do is you, you sort of take into, into account this explicit split between um, this non-unitary Hamiltonian evolution and the second term over here um, to treat and treat the second term stochastically. So functionally what you do in the code is you, um, we can reduce it to solving a one dimensional Schrodinger equation evolved with this um, effective Hamiltonian because it's non-unitary, the norm of the wave function will decrease as a function of time. We compare that norm to a previously generated random number. And if the norm jumps below some threshold, um, then it triggers a jump from one of these jump operators. And there's a set of rules that, that tell us the probability for having either transitions up or down in the ladder um, as the simulation progresses, that you can just derive directly um, from these, the form of these CN and CN dagger operators. So in this quantum trajectories algorithm, instead of solving uh, this N by N problem for the, the, for the density matrix, we reduce it to a one-dimensional problem we solve Schrodinger equation and do stochastic jumps. So we might start the, sing, the, the system in a, in a singlet state, evolve it, and then it might jump over here. Then it evolves once again by the blue term until it, another jump is triggered and then it might jump here and so on. <clears throat> and these collapse operators, of course, encode all of the selection rules that um, are necessary. The other nice thing besides reducing the problem from n squared to n uh, that this quantum trajectories algorithm buys you is that, um, is that unlike doing it with the matrix where you, you have to then eventually send this matrix out over many, many computers because each one of the simulations fits on a small computer or, or one core and doesn't have to talk in any other cores, uh, it becomes what's called an embarrassingly parallel problem. So I can just you know, simulate a million independent trajectories, um, what we call quantum trajectories, and then I can get out the solution from that. And so that means if I have, the more computers I have at my disposal, um, you know, the faster I can get out results. May not be bad, good for the environment, but it's, it's, it's good for computing. <laughs> Now, um, an added benefit is that because at any moment in time, um, the system is in a well-defined color and angular momentum state. 
um, we don't have to put a, an angular momentum cutoff. As long as our, our lattice is fine enough and big enough, um, we can accommodate um, any angular momentum state now. So there's no L max cutoff anymore. The only cutoff is in the number of points on the lattice. Now, um, to begin the simulation, we have to sample um, bottomonium production points. And then once we've sam sampled the bottomonium production point and also its initial transverse momentum, we have to specify its quantum mechanical wave function. Um, and in this case, we're not setting up a bottomonium. What we're setting up is simply a delta function in, in space because at, at leading order in this, in one over M in the heavy quark mass, um, you formally get a delta function. It's just completely local production. Um, so what we, we put, if we could put a delta function in the simulation, we would, but uh, in practice, we have to smear the delta function with some smearing, which we call delta. Now, of course, this may not be too far from the truth because uh, in practice, M is not infinity, and there's always gonna be some broadening of this delta function due to, to finite mass effects. But in your mind, what you want to think is besides the uh, up to the factor of delta here is we're, we're starting with a delta function, wave, wave function, and then we let that involve. Um, that delta function includes overlaps with both the bound states and unbound states. Right? So there, ev everything is hiding in here. And then what we extract from the initial condition is the overlaps with all of the, the bound states that, that we're interested in. Now this uh, initial state is, a, as I showed on the sort of motivation slide, is a, is a quantum loop or linear superposition of, of all of these eigenstates. Um, now in practice, we had to take this delta to be something. So what we did was uh, in the end, it was 0.2 times the Bohr radius of the states. And that was just determined phenomenologically by just looking at when did we get close to the result um, when we could really do the delta function and solve the Lindblad equation in, in matrix form. So once we tune that, we know what the initial wave function is quite generic. There's nothing tuned if you like, there's only delta and we just produce little quantum mechanical delta functions as we, we go along. So uh, for the phenomenology part, what we did was, as I said, we sampled the bottomonium production points um, in, the, in the transverse plane. And for this simulation, when I show you today, it's all at zero rapidity. Um, using the, the binary collision uh, uh, overlap prof profile provided from, from Glauber. And then we sampled their initial transverse momentum um, from a one over ET to the four distribution. And we sampled the azimuthal angle just uniformly in, in phi. The background evolution through which you saw our states flying was provided by some three plus one dimensional hydrodynamics code. It's a little bit of overkill because we're only doing y is equal to zero, but we already had it on disks, so we just used it. And then uh, for each one of these states that's propagating here, we're going to record the temperature and whatever properties of the, the medium we might want to take into account along its trajectory. And then we solve the real-time Schrodinger equation with this complex potential and the jumps along each of these uh, physical trajectories. Now for each physical trajectory, we then additionally have to do this averaging over the, the quantum um, trajectory part of it. So there's a double average going on, on over physical trajectories. And then for each physical trajectory, a bunch of quantum trajectories so that we include all of the, the jump possibilities. Once they've propagated through and have escaped the, the plasma, we then uh, compute the final overlaps um, with, of the, the wave function that's been uh, run through the machine with the, our given uh, NNL state. And uh, we take the ratio of that to what it was originally. And that tells us the, the survival pr probability after we evolve average over the entire ensemble of quantum trajectories. Um, good. So um, in practice, what we used was a, a, a one-dimensional lattice with 4,000, whoops, 4,096 points, not lattices. And the, the box size, again, because we had these unbound states had to be quite large. We took it on the order of 100 times the, the Bohr radius, and we used a, a quite small time step. Now, uh, one downside, although I, I was a very happy and optimistic about this, the gains that you get from doing this split. Um, one thing is that you have to do a lot of these quantum trajectories. And it's, it's not clear uh, from the beginning um, 
you know, how many you're going to have to do. So the only thing you do is you just get the, the, the averages back and, and hope that they, they converge. And you, in, in the end, for what I'm going to show you here today, we used seven to 900,000 physical trajectories. And then for each of them, we used 50 to 100 quantum trajectories. So in total, we had to do 350, but 335 million trajectories to get the results out. So we're, we're trying to bring these numbers down. Um, we waste a lot of time following unbound states that we're not really particularly interested in, but we didn't want to um, make any uh, further simplifications at first. All right, so once they escape, we, uh, we extract their survival probability um, um, to escape the quarter-clone plasma, but the story's not over then because if that, this is, say, an excited state, well, well, they're all linear combinations. So the part of this that's a, you know, a, an upsilon 2s um, could undergo decay down to a 1s through some feed down channel after it escapes the upsilon, uh, after it escapes the quark on plasma. Typically, this happens on a, on a time scale of, let's say, 10 to the minus 10, which is a, is a much longer time scale than the quark on plasma lifetime. So, um, in what we have to do in practice then is to take our, our survival probabilities or the number that survive the, the quark one plasma explosion and then run them through a kind of feed down matrix where the, the, um, the, the a column vector here would correspond to the number of, of 1s, 2s, the, 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 um, the 1p states, the 3s, the 2p states, and the 2d, for example. These are the number that survived um, the explosion, if you like. And then we have to run that through the feed down matrix um, because 26% of upsilon 2s's will become an upsilon 1s. And that tells us the final number that we're going to observe. Now, all of these numbers in the feed down matrix are fixed from PGG values. And what's shown here is just the central values um, that were used. So, um, Good. So how do we get RAA then in the end? Um, so first we, we get the direct um, cross sections by inverting the feed down matrix with, from knowledge of the experimental cross section. So this is the, the you, if you like, the PP cross sections before feed down are applied. We then shoot them through the quark clone plasma. That's the calculation of the survival probability. Then after they have escaped, we feed them down through the feed down matrix and we divide by uh, the experimentally uh, observed PP cross-section in the same uh, class C, which I labeled generally C here. So what do the results look like? Um, so, so as I said, this is now with these 35 million different trajectories, um, physical and quantum. The, the blue is our, are the model predictions for 1S, uh, the red is 2s hiding down here, and the green is 3s. And the, the various points are the world's collected data. Um, some are at, at forward rapidity, some are at central rapidities, and all of the predictions that we made today are, are for y is equal to zero. Um, now, we've seen in past from other data and other models that the, the, the rapidity dependence of upsilon suppression is, is quite flat. So um, as a first study, I'm, I'm quite happy with just doing uh, y is equal to zero. So the, the left panel shows what happens if you hold gamma. So this was the, the shift in the real part of the potential. If you hold it at the sort of average, val average <laughs> uncertainty of the world right now, if you like. And then, um, and then we vary kappa in this range from that fit to the lattice data. And that gives the, the blue band here. On the right shows fixing kappa to the central value and varying uh, gamma around in this admittedly large range, but unfortunately that's the state of affairs. And uh, as we can see, the, the variation with gamma is, is bigger than the variation with, with, uh, with, with, with kappa. And this would give you some hope that, that perhaps uh, you can start, if you had enough data here, you could start winnowing down, uh, you know, suggested values for, for kappa and, and gamma. One thing you can do immediately once you have RAA predictions for the 1s, the 2s, and the 3s, you can start looking at their double ratios. And these are, are, um, are interesting. Let me show you the results here first, um, because two things happen. One, in the experimental data, systematic errors cancel because uh, 
they, they don't have to adjust for the different acceptances when they compute the, the 2s to 1s ratio in PP, or at least there's fewer acceptance corrections. Um, and so the, the, in principle, the experimental data will be uh, more constraining in terms of the, the systematic error. And then that drives you to just get more statistics. The other thing that happens, which is demonstrated here, if you look at the 2s to 1s ratio and you look at the variation over kappa, you see that it's almost gone. So um, this sort of locks us down model-wise that we make a kind of uh, very um, you know, thin, uh, uh, precise prediction for what this will be. Now, on the other side, if you vary gamma, you see that it starts to vary around a lot. So there's some hope that because this observable doesn't depend on, on kappa, but does depend on gamma, that from, from looking at these double ratios um, with higher statistics, one could eventually start to, um, to use experimental data to constrain gamma itself. And the, the same thing happens in the 2s two to, two to 1s and, and the 3s to 1s. Um, I wouldn't hold out too much hope for the 3s to 1s uh, because the 3s production is so small and because it's so highly suppressed, it's, it's really hard. Um, the CMS people are now working on turning these bounds uh, from bounds into actual data. Now, one thing I skipped over, but I wanted to mention is the effect of the quantum jumps. So as I told you, you could you can look at this thing in, in, two, in two ways, right? One, you just have this uh, non-unitary Hamiltonian evolution, and then there's the effect of that jump term in the Lindblad equation. And in the past, most phenomenology was based on the first term, um, the one that didn't contain the jumps. And what's new that we're adding now is adding, adding the jumps, essentially. And you can ask, well, what, what was the final effect of the jumps, right? So what we did was some, some simulations um, with jumps and no jumps. So no jumps is just the pure Hamiltonian evolution. Um, and as you can see, if you scan in most panels, um, you know, it's not bad. They, they, you could probably just turn off the jumps and do it more efficiently. And that's particularly true for the 1S. It seems to be completely dominated by this no jump um, non-unitary um, evolution of the Hamiltonian. As we get to the, um, to the excited states, however, now it depends on which corner of this parameter space in terms of kappa and gamma you are as to whether it's important or not. And because we were, you know, wanted to probe this uh, part of the parameter space as well, uh, that means we have, to, we have to include the jumps in, in, in general. Now, even in the middle of the parameter range, you see uh, a, you know, a not insignificant effect on, the, on, the, on these uh, excited states. This is on a log scale. So it's actually, um, it's, it's a big effect. So the other thing that we can extract because we sample the transverse momentum of the upsilons that are shooting through the plasma is also the dependence of, uh, of RAA uh, on PT. Um, uh, we reproduced that quite well. I wanted to show you a more sensitive observable, which is now this double ratio as a function of transverse momentum. And uh, on the left is the same variation over kappa, um, which again, you see that it collapses. And on the right, you see this variation over gamma. So once again, it's a, a sort of push for me to try to <laughs> um, get more data for this double ratio because it will eventually allow us to um, have uh, experimental constraints on this on this mass shift uh, parameter. Now, in addition to RAA, um, by doing uh, this uh, sampling, we can also start getting uh, predictions for the the flow of bottomonium. Now, um, my my bias is that bottomonium won't flow in the in the traditional sense because it's it's too heavy. It's a billiard ball and a, a sea of ping pong balls, but I don't know. Um, we're going to try to to model bottomonium in this case as just differential RAA. So just it's going to you know it will depend on which path length you take through the plasma, either the short side or the long slide. And because the plasma is expanding, there could be some complicated interplay between plasma expansion and escape. Now. Um, so we're gonna make predictions for V2, but as I emphasized, it doesn't flow in, in my estimation in, in, the, in the collective flow sense. Um, there will be momentum space anisotropies, but they're mostly path length uh, triggered. This is backed up by um, you know, this plot that was in CERN Courier in, in fall of 2019, where we see the J psi flow sitting up here at, at point one, and then the upsilon down here uh, near zero. Now, admittedly, large error bars, but hopefully uh, reducing. 
Now, if you if you take um, these sort of standard um, bottomonium suppression models, I, the the TAMU one is based on um, the sort of T matrix transport model. Um, it gives you this very magenta line that's hiding under here, and then um, together with uh, Baduri and, and Borghini and Jaiswal, we also um, back in the day made a prediction um, just using this H effective evolution without jumps. Back. And uh, you can see that uh, at least all, everyone predicts that there's, there's not going to be any uh, bottomonium flow. But um, to my eye, um, you know, that's not enough because what I want to do is now use this to try to, you know, tell different models apart from one another because most of the models these days will be able to get into the ballpark of RA as a function of N part N as a function of PT. And now we can start using uh, this flow, albeit small, as a sort of uh, way to, to peel apart different models. So as my, my last result, what I wanted to show you um, was our predictions that are forthcoming for the flow of the uh, Upsilon uh, 2S, uh, sorry, of 1S up in the, in the top. The same uh, labeling as before, here we're varying kappa around and here we're, we're varying gamma. And uh, in this case, there are still some um, visible uh, statistical errors on the QTRAJ predictions because um, V2 is, is, a, is a difficult thing to, to, to compute and uh, you need lots of statistics, but um, we're mostly dominated by the, the variations over these parameters here. But um, we're always within the one to 2% to range. And if we go out to, to, to rather the 50 to 90% uh, centrality bin, we have a, a, a rather precise prediction. Now, um, if we focus on the, the completely integrated V2, then um, there, um, the model uncertainties and the statistical uncertainty coming from the average of trajectories are small. And we have, a, we have a prediction, which you can see, which is a little bit less than, than 1%. Now, we can, we can also make predictions for the excited states. Um, there have been some attempts by the CMS people to start getting uh, 2S, um, V2 out. 3S is, is probably hopeful, hopeless. But once again, um, here we see less model variation. Um, and we're also able to extract um, very precise uh, predictions for, for the V2 of the excited states as well. And we can do that not only as a function of centrality, um, we can do that as a function of PT, and we see it's very flat, which is consistent uh, with other models. Good, uh, that brings me to the last slide. Um, so, um, what I tried to describe today was this sort of um, open quantum systems plus PRN, PRN or QCD approach. Um, in the end, we got to comparisons with some data and we, we saw that it, it agrees with, with some, at least some of the data, if not most. Um, and I wanted to emphasize that um, although other models can reproduce this same data, um, this calculation is the first quantum and non-abelian treatment of, of open quantum systems in, in the QGP. So um, by including these jump operators and now you know, solving the full Lindblad equation, uh, we've gone one, one step beyond uh, what was done before. And in the end, um, we had, at least in the underlying theory, there was only two uh, fundamental things appearing, which were these, um, these transport coefficients, kappa and gamma. And there it is possible to constrain them by independent lattice measurements. They're not going to be independent parameters that we're going to tune to data. And, and as I showed, there's some hope, particularly in the, in the double ratios, um, since at least in this model and maybe others, you see that you know, um, at least the, the, the variation, the total width seems to go away because both, if you increase the, the total width for the 1S and the, and the 2S, they both go down. So that is a correlated suppression. So maybe in the 1S, um, in these double ratios, there, there's some hope to start um, further pinning down models. And uh, with that, I'll finish. Thanks. Well, thank you very much. Now we will have some time for questions. Uh, the first question is Shuzhi. Um, Hello. Hi, um, thank you for the very nice talk. And I might have some naive question regarding um, slides 29 and 28. Um, yes. So in 29, um, you, 
sort of calculate the um, um, RAA according to you know, uh, some direct sigma, which is the inverse of uh, sigma exp uh, experiment. Uh, yes. Uh, um, times the inverse of the um, fit down uh, matrix. Mm -hmm. So yes. my question is, I would assume this is true if the um, uh, experimental results are entirely for the finally observed particles without any correction uh, like you do here. Uh, is that correct? So um, the reason we have to use direct here and not the experimental mm -hmm. cross sections, right, is because uh, this is all happening before feed down, right? So right. we need um, we need to know the number of all the states before feed down uh, starts, right? And our naive model is that mm -hmm. the initial production looks like scaled up PP. So what we're going to use is just the, the the you know the PP direct cross section. Is there is there an issue with that? Uh, well, I mean, what I was wondering is when uh, the um, experimental measurements report their data. So did they consider or did they correct the feedback effect uh, like what you do here? No, no. So, so in, in lead lead, for example, mm -hmm. when they calculate mm -hmm. RAA, it's not feed down corrected afterwards. Uh, right? So they, they don't feed down correct the cross sections in lead lead. Uh, how about PP? In, in PP, there are people that, that do it, yes. So um, there are people that extract what we call sigma direct mm -hmm. here. Um, but in lead lead, what's reported mm -hmm. is the post feed down, um, you know, <laughs> lead lead result over the post feed down PP. I see. So, uh, I see. Okay. Because I was reading uh, your another paper, uh, the um, j -Hat paper computing the quaternion production uh, mm -hmm. using the, you know, solving the time dependent shorting equation. Yeah. And uh, in that paper, I have the impression that, um, you know, what the experimental people uh, report is the uh, cross section after fit down. And you have to do the inverse of the fit down uh, matrix to get the primordial uh, cross section. Uh, yeah, yeah, that, that's not the case. I was also confused at some point about this. But if you, you go, mm -hmm. for example, um, to the Alice or CMS papers, mm -hmm. They, they just take the raw cross section from, from lead lead mm -hmm. um, and then divide it by the, you know, the scaled PP with no feed down corrections applied. I see. Either. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, thank you for the uh, clarification. And um, my another question is, so um, to initialize the quantum state, um, you use some Gaussian, uh, Gaussian function, yes, uh, to mimic the delta, uh, uh, delta function, right? Yeah. And um, you use some parameter uh, for delta here. So a uh, naive expectation is, suppose uh, I use delta here um, to do the um, overlap of this, this initial state with some certain um, bound state. Yeah. The um, um, ratio of this overlap or overlap square should mm -hmm. give me the um, ratio of cross-section primordial. primordial. Uh, is that correct? Yes, that is correct, right? And uh, yeah, and as you take delta mm -hmm. to zero, you can compute um, what's the delta function limit of these overlaps. Mm -hmm. So you know what that, and, and they overlaps very, very quickly as delta goes to zero uh, approach the delta function result. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and, the, and then the relative occupancies of the different states, say the 2s to the 1s, mm -hmm. Are come from you know, like the two s overlap with that smeared delta function over the one s overlap, right? Yes. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, then I, I wonder. So, uh, if you or we do this, um, you know, comparison, does this, um, you know, ratio fits the the the, the ratio between the uh, sigmas, the cross sections? Right. Uh, it I, does, I just it wonder. Does, it, it does not, no, it does not, right? So I, I don't remember the exact ratios, but I, mm -hmm. as I recall, the 2s to 1s was something like point in the delta function case was a little mm -hmm. bit stronger than what's observed experimentally. I see, I see. Um, so does it so indicate um, that yeah, would be one, other, other ways to initialize the quantum state? Yeah, you, you want a delta function. You could imagine trying tuning delta so that you get closer mm -hmm. to the experimentally 
observed uh, ratios or, or having a more elaborated initial state. It, it will still have to be highly localized, but you could imagine tweaking this to try to better reproduce those ratios, yes. Cool, uh, thank you. No problem. Okay, uh, next question from Johnny War, let's go right. Uh, we cannot hear you, you have to unmute yourself. Sorry, sorry. Um, so my original question, I think, was partly from not paying sufficient attention to the talk because I was going to ask about the, uh, the inclusion of the P waves and they were included in the whole thing. But so I can re reformulate the question. Mm -hmm. Maybe if you can, so you do, you have this big matrix and you can presumably disentangle the effect then from the P waves and the S wave, the various S wave and P wave states in prior to the feed down. So uh, do you have any information, further information to give about that? Because I mean, there is, as you know, there's dispute about what's happening with the P waves in bottomonium. Yeah, unfortunately, um, I only have that in the paper, but we did make uh, um, predictions, at least for the survival probability of the P wave states, mm -hmm. um, both 1P and 2P. And yeah, and we also looked at octet states. We looked at a lot of different things, but I, I don't have that slide here. It went into, into this calculation because we needed to know the P wave suppression in order to get the P wave feed down contribution in the end. Um, but I, I don't have that plot for you. Um, they, they're highly suppressed. They look like the, you know, the, the 2S and the 3S because they have very low binding energies. Um, but we, don't, we didn't make predictions for RAA, for example, for these because it's, it's virtually impossible to measure. Okay, thank you. Okay, next question is Uli Hines. Yeah, Mike, thanks for a very, very nice talk. Um, you mentioned that you use the hydrodynamic model for the um, medium evolution. Yeah. Uh, and you also said it's probably overkill. But do you have some, from your studies, do you have some feeling for which features of the medium evolution matter for your results and which features are not worth putting a lot of effort into? Um, well, you know, in the old days when we were looking at the variation, um, we would present plots by varying E over S around. Um, mm -hmm. And that was attributed, this was back before we're doing what we're doing now is, you know, adiabatic approximation with the, and, and there what we saw was a, a sizable variation with E over S. And it's hard to say um, whether that variation with E over S was just due to you know the different temperature evolutions or some underlying momentum anisotropy effect. Mm -hmm. right? And in those simulations, we were able to look at the momentum anisotropy effect because it was simpler. We weren't having to solve this Lindblad equation. We were you know just doing a toy model essentially. Um, and there. Um, that anisotropy effect translated in a big dependence on E over S. Now I, have, I haven't checked here because we only ran with one E over S. What mm -hmm. would be the corresponding variation if I started also varying E over S? I tried, I tried to pin myself down these days by taking the fit to the hydro so that I don't have that, any additional knobs to play with. Um, now we started looking again at the anisotropy effect within this new framework. And at least in the first pass, it looks to be small, um, but we're still looking at yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, that was that was maybe a question. Is it, does, does radial flow matter? Does elliptic flow matter? What's the relative importance of those? Um, does, do any of these matter to the extent that you really have to do hydro rather than some kind of fireball model as done in the old days? That, yeah, that's, that's a good question. Yeah, I, we haven't tried to peel apart uh, so you want to, yeah, we, we, we did look at at least the order of magnitude for flow. I mean, the flow doesn't seem to matter too much mm -hmm. for overall RAA. Um, it starts to matter a little bit for V2. So um, for you, the, the, the geometric size is more important than the flow? For RAA, yes. Um, once you get to V2, it becomes a little tricky because, um, because um, if you turn off uh, you know, all trans, if you have, you know, uh, real pressure driven flow, right, it pushes more out along one direction than another. And, and that can um, have the effect of essentially overtaking some bottomonium states with mm -hmm. um, low velocity. 
So in there, you can have a kind of feedback between the V2 of the, of the medium itself uh, uh, that's developed and the observed V2 of the upsilon. But I would, I would guess at this point that for RAA, um, not much of this matters beyond getting, you know, I want to get something that's tuned to hydro that I know reproduces spectra and stuff like that. Right, you don't have to worry about the model, but you also don't understand how important its details are. Right. Um, yeah. Well, in okay. some cases, no, I can say which are not important and, and which yeah, are. Right, but right. yeah, there's been no comprehensive study, I admit. Yes. Okay. Any other questions? Actually, I had a sort of simple clarifying question. It's sort of related to what, what, what uh, Uli was asking. So uh, the, uh, my understanding when you were talking that V2 for the botonium, uh, botonium will come primarily because of the uh, short versus long distance traveling through the medium. But now you seem to say that this is not quite true. So can you clarify that? Yeah. So. Um... That was what this little um, cartoon, I didn't want to get into too many details, but um, I, and I just mentioned it out loud to, to Uli, so let's go through it. So you can imagine that the, you know, if it really is path length dependence, that the ones that, that are born here in the center of the fireball are basically killed. The ones that are going to survive are the ones that are, are on the outside, and not only the ones on the outside, they're the ones that are propagating out rather than in, right? And then you can imagine trying to follow these guys as a function of time. Now, of course, um, because the plasma expands more along the short side than the long side, the plasma can, can overtake um, these guys and start resuppressing them essentially. So they have an, a larger effective path length because they, they encounter the, the plasma more than once. Um, so it's still a kind of path length dependence if you like, but um, it's not just short side over long side. And in this, this thing that's sitting down here, which is this red dotted line, um, that's how we ended up getting a prediction for negative V2. Um, this was without the jump operators. It doesn't seem to survive the jump operators, but at least in that model, this negative V2, we could attribute um, to this effect. And the way that we checked was just by turning off the transverse flow um, and then just using the initial temperature profile and just, you know, reducing the temperature down and this little negative dip went away. This is very nice because the, such an effect is also important for jet quenching and has not been explored yet. Right. That the medium can right. overcome some of the right. jets. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's easier with the bottomonium states because they're so heavy to get them moving at a, a, a velocity less than the speed of, of the medium. I see. I see. Uh, okay, thanks. Um, there is another question from Kaiju. Uh, hello, Michael. Very nice talk. So okay. my question might also be related to this uh, flow calculation that maybe I missed, but I didn't mm -hmm. capture where the momentum information of the bond state can enter your formalism. Um, it doesn't. Like so, the only way the the transverse momentum enters into the calculation currently is. Uh, telling us, you know, what is the, the physical space trajectory of the, of the state. The potentials that we use don't have any PT dependence at all. Now, in principle, you have to include it eventually. We're, we're working on it. Um, what happens is, you know, you have a, a, you know, essentially a thing that's not in the local rest frame of the, of the fluid. You have to boost and then yeah. what happens is you get an anisotropy <laughs> um, yeah. in the potential. Yeah, I think that might be the reason why the flow of the medium doesn't matter a lot here for your result. Mm -hmm. Could be. Could be. I don't know. You know, no, right. um, you know th this has not been included any PT dependence in the potentials, um, but it's in the big to-do list, yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, well, let me interject another one. Uh, do you know what would be the role of a strong magnetic field in the early stages of the uh, collision uh, when the bottomonium could be kept closer together to form a bound state? You know, I mean, there's been, um, uh, there's been people that write about this, Kirill, myself, uh, 10 years ago, I don't remember. Um, 
Yeah, so you would you would imagine that you could enhance the initial production because of the the magnetic field because you know you can somehow <laughs> they can find each other more easily. But then uh, as as, as Tukin has written, there's also a, a, an additional dissociative effect due to the to the magnetic fields, which, which you can think of in the local rest frame as some, um, if you boost to where the B is gone, right, um, then it looks like an E field in the local rest frame that causes dissociation. Um, so pe people have looked at it. I don't know of any um, models that have tried to go, go through the beginning to the end to try to you know, put this on an RAA plot. Um, but yeah, you, I would expect enhanced production. And, and in fact, what also happens in the presence of the magnetic field, there was a paper with myself and Navara and Neronia and some other people back in, you, you shift the mass of the eigenstates, right? And this can also affect the, the production cross sections um, in the initial state. Uh, well, you probably don't shift it much for bottom, but bottom quarks. Not for bottom, no, the, the shifts are small, yes. For bottom, the bigger effects are coming from the, um, from the, the spin magnetic moment uh, interactions. And so you'll, you'll see a, a bigger split between the, the 1S and the eta, for example, that's driven by, by the background magnetic field. All right, okay, anybody else? Questions. Well, let me ask my last question that I noted down when I was listening to this. Uh, when you were uh, writing uh, these two parameters, kappa and gamma, that come from the uh, gluon polarization tensor, one of them, my understanding, and please correct me if I misunderstood it, my understanding that one of them is essentially the absorptive part of the polarization tensor, the other one is non absorptive part. So, roughly speaking, like a dielectric constant and the um, conductivity of sorts or some transport coefficient similar to conductivity. Now, one of them determines the width, the other one is the real part of the mass, right? And you are saying, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, that that correction to the mass appears to be negligible for the bound state. And it's really only the width that is uh, seemingly important. Yeah, I mean, from this theory, you don't know, right? I mean, you could try to compute this thing perturbatively. And I think if you do it perturbatively, you get a quite large number here for the shift, uh -huh. right? Well, the reason I say it's small is because the lattice is saying it's small. Um, and at least as a function of time, if I look at the lattice data, it's it's trending smaller. <laughs> Is is this is this calculation? For, I, I, can, I didn't look I into this. I can show you a picture of it actually because I, I have it here, right? So this is, I think this was taken from the the thing the re recent paper where they show that it's but quite is small, uh, but. is this gamma getting large non perturbative correction? Because I'm I'm a bit confused. I would assume that it shouldn't. Yeah, it seems it doesn't. Um, I mean, if you look down but here, but you say that the lattice and the perturbative are very different. Yes, the lattice and the perturbative truncated at whatever order, you know, low order was done, um, are inconsistent, yes. Huh. Well, that's something to think about. Okay, thank you. I, I think I had... Um, yeah, so you can see, and if you follow this reference, you should be able to <laughs> get the blue ones, right? They're big, right? Yeah, lattice seems to say it's way down here <laughs> somewhere. Is it completely under control on the lattice? Um, I'm not a lattice expert, but my lattice friends tell me yes. <laughs> okay, well, let's take that. Whatever it's worth. Well, at least, okay. um, I mean, at least, at least what Peter and these guys have done, and I, I don't want to, um, because I'm involved with these guys, I can't. I can't speak for them, but I mean, if you look at the, this recent paper that had, oh, sorry, it's way back, this one, um, the, the, their ability to reproduce the, the potential these days is amazing. And then they can really tell if there's a shift in the real part. And this only shows the real part of the singlet free energy, but so. Okay. Well, the arrow bars are going down as a function of time instead of up. You know, that's all. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> all right, all right. Okay, I don't see any other, other questions. Last call. Any questions before we wrap this up? 
And uh, using this opportunity, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Mike again for a very nice presentation and creating a lot of um, energy about this topic. Thanks.